Well, good evening and welcome. On behalf of the Bay Path University community, I'd like to thank you for being with us and let you know just how delighted we are that you're joining us this evening for our third 2021 Black History Month celebration. As you know, contributions and resilience of our Black community. I'm Stacey Sweeney, uh, Vice President of Academic Administration here at Bay Path. And for those of you who may not be, who may be new, I should say, to Bay Path University, we were founded in 1897, and we have a rich history of educating undergraduate women and also women and men in over 50 graduate certificate programs. In addition, we have several doctoral programs in areas related to healthcare and education, and our programs are innovative, they're career focused, and they've really evolved in response to the economic, cultural, and technological influences of our time. And in celebration of Black History Month, Bay Path University has coordinated several virtual events to honor the struggles and stories and successes of Black Americans. And these events are related to a theme of cultural empowerment, remaining true to oneself, and also an opportunity to promote Black-owned businesses. Logistics have been thoughtfully planned with student input to help shape the narrative of the Black community, so we're really excited about that. And we're really grateful for the leadership of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Community Council here at Bay Path and the 2021 Black History Month Planning Committee, Student Life, and the Office of Multicultural Affairs. We're really grateful for their vision and their efforts in designing and executing these engaging events to celebrate and honor Black culture and experiences. Now these programs are student-led and it's a significant part of our diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies. And I'm gonna introduce Janelle Smith, class of 2023, and Cora Swan, also class of 2023, two incredibly talented student leaders who will be moderating our event this evening. So please join me in giving them a warm welcome. Welcome, welcome. Oh, hello everyone. Thank you, Stacy. My name is Cora Swan. I am a graduate in 2023, a digital media major, and I'm the multicultural advocate. And I serve in various leadership capacities on campus, including a member, being a member of the Black Student Union Club, um, I'm part of the DEI Student Subcommittee, and I'm very excited to be here with all of you. At this time, we will view a short video listing all of the series of events we've organized for Black History Month. And we will also take some time to remember the Black lives we have lost to police brutality and commemorate our lost heroes and celebrate recent achievements. Lift every voice and sing till I think Thank you. 
What an awesome video. And hello everyone, I am Janelle Smith and I'm currently an undergraduate student here at Bay Path majoring in business administration and marketing. I am the president of the Black Student Union here at Bay Path and I'm also involved in the Diversity and Inclusion Equity Board. And I'm so excited to be here and to learn about all the stories and best practices shared by Sheena Collier and our local business leader panelist. So today we are joined with Daryl Gibbs, owner of Bumpy's Organic and Healthy Foods in Springfield, Massachusetts, Mariah Lee Wilkins, founder of social enterprise Rooted Essence Dance and Health Healing Arts. Mariah holds a bachelor's in psychology and minor in African American studies from Howard University and a master's in business administration from Bay Path University, class of 2020. We're also joined with Kamani Harrison, CEO of Key Books um, in Hartford, Connecticut, and environmental. She is also an environmental engineer whose mission is grounded on the pillars of Afrocentricity, spirituality, environmentalism, and entrepreneurship. And we are also joined with Leonard Underwood, owner and founder of Underwood Photography and Upscale Socks. Lenny holds a bachelor's and master's degree in public administration with a minor in business. The self-proclaimed serial entrepreneur is a member of St. John's Congressional Church, the Brianna Fund for Children with Physical Disabilities Gospel Concert Planning Committee, and a board member for, Way for Wayfinders. And last but not least, our keynote speaker, Sheena Collier. She is a super connector, conveyor, and strategic planner. As a founder and CEO of the Collier Connection, she is designing a portfolio of solutions that disrupt the ways that people of color seek information, access, and belonging. Sheena also specializes in strategies to help companies engage employees, customers, and suppliers of color through inclusive events and business practices. Sheena has achieved many recognitions, including the 2020 recipient of the Harvard Club's Boston's Most Influential Women's Award, the 2020 recipient of YW's Boston's Academy of Women's Achievers, Sylvia Farrell Jones Award, the 2018 recipient of the GK25 Who is Who Millennial Leaders of Colors Award, the 2017 and 2018 nominee of the Ad Club's Rosserves Awards and 2016 recipient of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce's 10 Outstanding Young Leaders Award. Sheena is a proud board member of the Jerome Program, Bo Program Boston and Union Capital Boston, advisory board member of the Boston Harbor Now, investor in the Boston Geo Fund and a member of the Black Economic Council of Massachusetts. She received her bachelor's awards from Spelman College and her EDM from Harvard Graduate School of Education. Please give a warm welcome to our panelists and keynote speaker. And without further ado, please welcome Sheena Collier. Hello. <laughs> good evening. Sorry, I was trying to get off mute there. Um, good evening. Thank you for that introduction. Um, as was said, my name is Sheena Collier, founder and CEO of the Collier Connection in Boston Wild Black. Um, I'm so excited to be here as a part of, as you all are wrapping up, uh, your month of Black History celebrations. I'm very honored to be invited as your keynote speaker um, and really glad that the university was responsive to the call from students to take the time to fully recognize Black history um, celebrate Black culture uh, throughout February and hopefully uh, beyond that. I know you've had some amazing speakers already, including my friend Kim Roxy, uh, who's the owner of Lamique Beauty. Um, she's actually someone I met um, since we've been in the pandemic um, through other mutual friends. And we've um, had a sister circle of Black women entrepreneurs every Saturday um, that checked in on each other. So was excited to see she was connected as well. Um, and as was mentioned tonight, you're gonna hear from some really amazing uh, business owners from across the state. Uh, I'm new to learning about Bay Path. Uh, I, I actually attended another col women's college, as was said, um, Spelman College, which is also an HBCU. 
And I'm a big supporter and fan of spaces like this that are created for women, created for people of color, uh, for other groups who are really looking for a sense of belonging and a safe place to grow. And that's exactly why I uh, started um, the businesses that I started um, to really create space for others who are searching for a community where they are valued, uh, where they can contribute and where they too feel like they belong. Uh, so I'm gonna give you all a little background about me um, and then I have some advice for you. Um, really whether you're an entrepreneur or not, I believe we're all creators in some way. So um, I'm originally from Albany, New York. I have seven older siblings. Um, but I, I somewhat grew up as an only child because my sisters and brothers are so much older than me. And so, you know, this was a time before there was a lot of technology. Um, so I've always been a creator kind of out of necessity. Folks who are only children understand um, you have a lot of make-believe friends and games. And um, I spent a lot of time making up dances and acting like my, my little cousins were my students. Uh, I actually decided at the age of six that I wanted to be a teacher. And it was really because of um, the great experience that I had in school and how much I loved my first grade teacher, Mrs. Hill. Um, but as I got to middle and high school, I decided that I wanted to be a school psychologist because I realized even at that stage in life that a lot of young people, um, a lot of kids I was growing up with and, and myself included, um, really lack the mental health support that they should have been getting. And so um, that's what I went to college and grad school with. That's what, what brought me up here. Um, when I left to attend Spelman at 17, it was my first time away from home. And though it was an environment with people who look like me, it was actually my first time around black people who had come from wealth, um, who had exposure and knowledge of things I had never heard of. Um, and it was really intimidating and I went into a shell and really was ashamed of where I was from and what I felt I didn't know. Um, then I came to, to Boston, to Harvard of all places and uh, really might as, well, might as well went to Mars because uh, that's how out of place I felt. You know, and often would say that I was being brought places academically that I wasn't, didn't feel ready for socially. Um, and when I came up here, I had never been in the minority before. So, you know, I went to this black college growing up in Albany. I went to all our mostly black schools. Um, and so I had never really had to work to try to find community. Um, and that was um, the first time I had to do that here. Um, so I, I hated Boston for many years. Um, I tried to leave many times. I actually did leave once. And um, a little technical difficulty. Um, I hated Boston for many years. You know, I tried to leave many times. I left once and moved to DC for two years. Um, and I ultimately came back uh, because this is where my tribe is, my community was. I had, I had spent a lot of time building community here. Um, I made a major career shift about uh, five uh, years ago or so and actually left the field of K through 12 education to investigate how I could create solutions to the problems I and others um, that I met had faced for many years of really how to Boston while black, uh, which is what I ended up calling my company. Um, and that's what I really want to talk to you about is um, creating solutions to the problems that you face in the world. And so I did it through business. You may do it another way. Um, but regardless, as I said, we all have the opportunity to be creators. Um, and so I just want to share a little bit of what I've learned thus far as an entrepreneur. Uh, you know, I'm still fairly new to this. So this, this isn't like um, sage old grandma advice. This is like uh, your, your auntie who's only a few years older than you. Um, and, and she's still living her best life before she settles down and gets married. That's, that's kind of where I am business wise. Um, but definitely have some, some gems to share and you know, would love to um, learn from you all kind of what are the, the problems that you're trying to solve here in the world. So these are three of the things that I learned some the hard way um, in the five years since I've been doing this um, and um, you know, really decided to create this business, um, doing the things that I was always doing, connecting people to information, experiences in each other. So. The first thing that I would share and that I've really learned is 
Um, and I, and I, you know, my uh, fellow um, business owners can probably attest to some of this. What you start off thinking that you're building may not end up being what you eventually build, but you just have to get started. And so I am an over overthinker. I'm a planner by nature. My first business was event planning. Um, I like to calculate risks. I like to think through every alternative and try to estimate the impact down the line. Uh, you should see me ordering food at a restaurant. You will literally think it's like my last meal. Um, I, I put so much thought into it. And, and while that trait came in handy in, in my life as an educator, um, it comes in handy when my homegirls want to take a trip and someone needs to put it, pull it together. Um, but it has almost um, broken me at times as a business owner. You know, so I've, I've let opportunities pass by because it wasn't the quote unquote right time. Um, I have broken out into cold sweats when I just need to choose a date for something to launch something because I'm not sure that I'm actually ready to do it. And uh, really more than it really being my just skills as a planner, it's really a, a fear of failure, you know, and being a per perfectionist. Um, and I'm sure we've all heard many times, you can't let perfect be the enemy of good. And sometimes you just have to put out what's good enough so that you can get feedback. Maybe you do fail. Um, and then you use that feedback to build something great. Uh, so that's, that's the first thing I've learned. The second is really do follow your passion. And I know that's something that, um, you know, it's a phrase that's used a lot now. Uh, definitely follow your passion, but don't be too rigid if you're trying to build a business and not a hobby. And what I mean is, you have to pay attention to what people will pay for. Um, of course, we all think that the things we want and need, other people want and need to. And in some cases that might be true, but do enough people want it to make it into a business. And I've had to add elements to my business that are, um, I, I'll just say, I 100% I enjoy what I do, um, but I've had to, add in things that were maybe weren't the original idea that I had, but I, I realized like, wow, this is something people want to pay for. Like, this is something that people want. So I need to pay attention to it. Um, and I, you know, I've started a number of different services throughout the years. Um, I've, I've done everything. Some, one of my friends reminded me today about a podcast that I used to have. Like, you know, if I, if I decide I want to do something, I, I will go do it, but I'm also flexible enough to know when to stop and flexible enough to know when to pivot. And particularly a year like this with uh, our 2020, um, I, you know, all of us as business owners did a lot of pivoting and had to figure out how to um, still stay true to ourselves, but really serve people in the way that they wanna be served. Um, and so it doesn't mean that you won't come back to do the things that you love, but I have a mortgage, you have student loans, um, you, you have to be realistic, you know, about um, what you're putting your energy and your time into. Um, and then the third thing I would share is really find early supporters of whatever you're trying to create or build and make them your ambassadors in your cheering squad. And so, you know, if you, my first business is called the Collier Connection, right? My last name is Collier. So, you know, it's this play on my name. And I'm constantly talking about activating your network. Um, I even do a workshop called the person that you want to meet is already in your network. Uh, because I actually believe that we all can do a better job of looking at who we already know to help us meet who we want to know. Um, and because I, I'm naturally and in, in a lot of my profession was around community organizing, that's the way that I approach building my business, both of my businesses. So particularly for the Collier Connection, before I even had a name for it, I sent out an email to about 50 people, former supervisors, friends, old coworkers. I, and I said to them, you know, remember how I used to love host parties? I'm a big party host. Um, you know, remember how I would host parties and plan events and you know how I'm always introducing people to each other? Well, now I actually wanna make money doing that. <laughs> and I don't totally know what I'm doing, so I'm asking for your help. And I asked them, would they be willing to let me survey them as I built out different parts of this business? Um, so, I, so again, I could make sure it wasn't just about what I wanted to do, but what people would actually buy. And they said, yes. And so I would survey these folks probably every two to three weeks about what types of events they, they love, what, what events they hate in Boston, 
You know, what are the words or images that they think of when they think of the work that I do? Um, and I even let them name my business. And so I came up, I did come up with a, options. It wasn't like a free for all, um, but I, I gave them options and the majority voted for Collier, the Collier Connection and that's what I went for. Um, but more importantly, now I have these people who are invested what I, in what I'm doing because they, they co-created it and they're willing to set up meetings for me. They attend or send other people to my events. Um, they tell other people that they should support me. Um, I really, because I'm so relational, I struggle with transactional things like raising money or, or asking for money. And so this was just a more natural way for me to build my business in community. And I think that um, I'm grateful for it because there are many books on business and many ways that you're supposed to do things. Um, but I did it naturally in the way that I actually build is, is in community and in relationship. Um, so you know, I, I mentioned, you know, I'm still fairly new in the world of business. You know, I've been in business for, for five years. Um, and, and for a lot of that time, I was side hustling, meaning I had a job, a full-time job as well. Um, I've been fully on my own since April, 2019. Uh, so I have so much more to learn. Launched another business in 2020, Boston Mall Black. Um, and, you know, the other day I learned that um, the so-called kind of holy trinity of business is pricing, sales, and negotiation. Um, and so, you know, I think that um, with my, my first business and now having another business, um, there's so much more that I'm going to do that I'm going to learn. Um, I actually see Collier Connection being um, kind of like Harpo Productions, uh, which Oprah has, you know, so really like a parent company to a number of other businesses. Boston Wild Black grew out of Collier Connection. It was a program I was doing and grew into a business. Um, but even as I continue to grow, you know, these are the core lessons I think that will continue to guide me. Um, so again, put out, put out what's good until you get to great. Pay, a, pay attention um, to what people want um, while you're also telling them what they need. Because sometimes, sometimes people don't know, you know, you have, no one knew they needed an iPod until they existed. So you know, you, you can introduce new things to people sometimes, but you, you do need to listen to what they want. And then again, the best way to build anything is with community, even, even a business. Um, so I encourage you all as you um, think about, um, you know, Black History Month and beyond. Um, I, I actually forgot that Black History Month was coming because it's actually what I do every day. And so um, I, I didn't think of it as um, any a special month in particular, but as you are thinking about, you know, if you are black and thinking about your own identity and your contribution to the world, if you um, if you aren't and you're just thinking about, you know, how to support um, black people and other and indigenous people and other communities of color around you, um, you know, really um, thinking about what problem are you going to so solve in this world and what what's the medium you can create a business you can start an organization um you can just you know be in community with others um but i would encourage you to to kind of use these values and these um, kind of guiding principles um to solve the problems that you have thank you <laughs> that's great thank you sheena uh that was wonderful so uh, now we are going to ask the uh, panelists uh, some questions. I can start it off and then Janelle will ask some questions submitted from the audience. To make things easier, uh, I'll choose the order. First, Lenny should answer, then Kamani, and then Daryl. So the first question is, what inspired you to open your business? Thank you, Cora, for asking. I hope everyone can hear me okay and good evening. So, um, I'll start with Underwood Photography. When I was in high school and in college, I would um, I was on campus with my camera often. I would see events that were happening, be it in high school or on campus. And I would oftentimes call and see if they needed a photographer. Um, even if they didn't need me, uh, they would invite me to come and take photos. So that, that gave me a lot of confidence to really um, you know, work with crowds and people and, and get my feet wet with the, the industry. At the time, I didn't think I was going to actually go into business, 
but it was um, seen as a hobby. And my, my family told me to get a real job. So it wasn't anything that they even saw me continuing, continuing on as a career. Um, but I believed in it. Um, it. It certainly was something I was passionate about and enjoyed. And so um, in 2004 is when I officially launched um, Underwood Photography. And so with Upscale Socks, I got started, well, I had a dream one night in 2014, uh, one summer, and I don't know how many of you all remember your dreams, but I remember this dream, and I rarely do, and next morning, I told a friend about the dream. We thought about going into business together, but uh, we had different ideals when it came to um, business and just finances, so I had already been in ex existing business, and was willing to take the risk, whereas he was more uh, hesitant about it. So um, it took about a year to actually formulate the business and find people that were willing to support it and help um, with information. I never worked in retail before, so it was really new, new for me. And uh, in 2016 is when I officially launched um, Upscale Socks. And so it's been almost five years. All right, I guess I'm up next. So the beginnings of Key Bookstore uh, began in 2016, uh, around the same time when there was a lot of uh, political unrest at that time. Um, they were shutting down the freeways with human bodies being out there, uh, just running out there and things like that. There was a lot of stuff going on. And um, my immediate response to all the chaos in the world was to find a black owned bookstore and see if I could get some answers from there. And uh, that's what I did. I went to um, Zara's Books and Things in Inglewood, California, when I was out there and found just the book I was looking for, which is Survival Strategies for Africans in America, and uh, read that book and found exactly what I needed from it, that there was so much that I didn't know, but here's where to find more information. And after reading so many books, um, ending with Dr. Claude Anderson's Powernomics, I was like, okay, um, the, one of the most impactful ways I can impact my community is through economics. And um, I was like, well, how, what, what could I give to my community? And because I love to read so much, um, I, I saw so many spaces that needed books. Um, so I'd be in the club, I'd be at all the parties and stuff like that. And they'd be selling all types of trinkets and shea butters and all that. And I'm like, well, these same spaces need books. And so um, open up the business in 2018 by popping up um, as a mobile bookstore and grew into an interactive online bookstore. And literally we get on Instagram, Facebook and uh, curate for the culture literally. So anything that's going on, we find the curation for it and present it to the people. So that's the beginnings of that. And my other business, Compro Tax Flame, is a Black-owned tax franchise. And that taxes was another way for us to positively impact our community. Um, so that's literally how that began. And we're in our second year in business as a, a three-part partnership. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me. My name is Daryl Gibbs. Uh, also, uh, everyone know I'm known as Bumpy. Uh, I got that name from uh, playing years of football. And that was the start of, uh, of how do I say, my whole entire uh, career. If you hear, I have a speech impediment. And I've had that all of my life. So it kind of taught me that when people laugh at you, um, you have to really uh, don't care because whatever you want to do in life, you have to push and it has to become the most important thing. Your goal has to become the most important thing, if I can explain it that way. Uh, um, if I can share one story that'll kind of explain 
my drive and my motivation. When I was younger, I, I wanted a job. So I went to this gas station and they weren't hiring. So I went there at around four o'clock in the morning. I cleaned up the entire gas station. And uh, the guy walked in in the, in the morning and he looked at me and I looked at him and he says, you're hired. So I knew that hard work, hard work uh, really pays off. And uh, that there was kind of my, my push throughout the, my whole entire life. What ended up happening uh, in high school in 12th grade, I had uh, an accident, hit in the head, playing football, had an epileptic seizure that ruined all of my college. So I, I end up uh, leaving school. I was in a very distraught area. I was down and, and out. And my dad told me, he says, uh, I raised you stronger than this. So I bounced back from that. And I went into the workforce. Uh, I began working as an accounting executive in a, uh, at a textbook company and a, uh, that sells paperback books and novels. And I'm still there today. <laughs> That's over 30 something years. Um, I, but I was able to head back and play football again. When I was playing football, I ended up uh, uh, finding out that I had what's called a horseshoe kidney. That means I only had one kidney. And uh, I had high blood pressure also. So, so heading over to the doctor, the doctor says, well, Daryl, you have to take these pills. I said, well, if you take these pills, I only have one kidney. He says, well, you, is the pills gonna ruin my kidney or what's gonna happen? So I started looking into natural foods, eating healthy. And that's where the whole food thing began here. Um, I worked two full-time jobs for 18 years. Um, and in that process, I always had a vision of what could I do for the community to help uh, people who had food issues. And I, the, I said, let's open up a natural and organic food store. That was my idea. I met a buddy of mine in, in Northampton, Mass, and he says, uh, Bumpy, I have a food store that we sell food uh, that's near or past its code date. I said, wow, that's a really good thing because I was spending a lot of money on in the Whole Foods and because I had to eat healthy food because I didn't want to take the pills. And I wanted to lower my blood pressure. So uh, I looked more into what uh, he was doing there. And he says, you can open up your own business. And that happened in about seven years ago. I opened up a, a store in Springfield, Massachusetts. Then from there, I moved over to Granby, Mass. And the struggles and the struggles. And from there, I moved over to Agawam, Mass. And now I'm at my final location here in Springfield, Massachusetts, 908 Allen Street. And it's officially Bumpy's Natural and Organic Foods. And the question was, what was the, why did I open up this business? Because now I understand I'm in an area where people who aren't able to get healthy food are able to shop and they're, they're able to get healthy foods that they need uh, in this community. Um, uh, we have fresh produce, we have um, vitamins. And I mean, it's, it's, I'm so, Every day I look at this, I get so excited because of how far and how I was able to fulfill my dream. And believe me, every day it's hard work up at four o'clock in the morning, picking up produce and late evenings. Again, uh, whatever your passion is, uh, you have to push, you have to work hard and never lose focus. Um, so, uh, that there is kind of what I wanted to, to share. If I can in, inspire any of you, any of you at all, uh, I would love to do so. Thank you so much. 
Oh, thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mariah Lee, and I'm just inspired by all of you. And thank you all for being here tonight. So I'm the founder of Rooted Essence Dance and Healing Arts. And I would say that what inspired me to start this company, it was divine inspiration. For me, it was divine direction. I had been in a place in my life where I was being rerouted and it didn't make sense to me, but because it didn't make sense to me, didn't mean that it wasn't the path I should go. So I started paying attention. I was um, honestly laid off of my career job in Washington, DC, and it was it came very abrupt and in a shocking way. So I knew there was something behind it and it was actually redirecting me to what I'm doing today. And so when I say divine inspiration and divine direction, that just means that I was being led to something that was more fulfilling to my overall life's purpose and call. And that is where I am now. And that is where, hence the name Rooted Essence, because it literally means your divine purpose. Um, so I would say this, uh, the company started out of a need for um, the community to be uplifted, to be connected, and to be restored. I'm from the city of Springfield, and I was one of those people who had to go off into other uh, cities to either educate myself or feel like there was things for young professionals who wanted to pursue higher education or just career. But I came back because I said, why not Springfield or why not Western Mass? And why not be the change that I wish to see as the infamous quote goes. So the company started as a couple of classes within a community center. It was a business trio hub on White Street in Springfield and uh, three other biz small businesses were there. I was the only female there. So they always call me the pioneer, the female pioneer. But um, as a result, I hung around people that were like-minded. I knew that if I was going to be anywhere, it had to be in an area that fed me. And I was led um, out of inspiration from the community, right? I asked myself, what do we need? I knew that we needed to see Springfield on the next level and over the last, uh, I would say even three years that I've been in business, I've seen it happen. Um, and we offer different, uh, we are a dance and wellness studio and we believe in uniting the community through uh, events, performances, as well as classes. And so I would say my inspiration was divine direction and divine inspiration. And I would say that um, if you are someone who's considering business, Think about what you do well and naturally. Think about what you're most passionate about. Think about your gifts and think about your passions. And that typically is the route you that will sustain you because you won't you won't get winded when you're passionate about it. So thank you. All right. Thank you all so much for what you guys have shared so far. And um, before we continue with our questions, just wanted to let the audience know that they're able to ask questions in the Q&A box. Um, so we'll definitely be monitoring that and taking questions. Um, so my first one for the panel is, were, um, was there anything that you guys shifted from to get to where you are today? So did you have a previous career beforehand and like, what did that look like? Can I answer? Yes, you can. Okay. So I, um, I have been, I've been a substitute teacher all of my adult life since 19. Um, and I still do that when school's in session. So that goes back to being a serial entrepreneur. I'm also a personal trainer. Um, shifting, um, well, nine years ago, I was, my, my job was reorganizing youth ministry. So um, that prompted me to go into photography full-time. So since then, um, it's been officially, you know, my full-time career. I think I was doing it full-time prior to that. It just wasn't anything official. Um, you know, we spend so much time building a business and 
um, not really having that confidence at times to really go full fledge um, full time. And, and that's what, you know, what happened when, when, when that occurred for me. So um, it's been since 2012. Okay, let's get this camera on. So my background, so right, I went to school for environmental engineering um, because I didn't want to do anything that wasn't going to impact the environment. Um, um, as far as engineering goes, you could do a lot of different types of engineering, but that was important to me. And I first went to work for a black owned engineering firm that I found right here in Hartford, um, also a UConn alum. And let's see, I, I worked for them for about a year and then it was just a really awful year. Uh, just, there was no more work at that point. So, um, and they were going through a huge transition. So I got laid off then and that's when I started Key Bookstore. And then I did Key Bookstore solely for about 10 months. And then I got another job um, as a air pollution control engineer, um, where I was auditing um, the businesses all over the state um, for their emissions and making sure that they're not over polluting the air. And that actually, that job, I experienced a lot of like microaggressions and I was the only black engineer let alone a black woman engineer um, hired uh, in my position. And just, I was experiencing things that none of the other ones were. And glad that I got out of that. And then uh, I got let go from there. And then within two months, my bookstore went viral and our sales went up like 80,000 percentages. So. Um, I needed to not be attached to anything at that point. So, yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, yeah, I worked as a juvenile correctional officer and um, I did that, that I was, that's what I did for 18 years. And, um, and I and an account executive also, and I, I do that still in a, I'm kind of a workaholic and I own, Bumpy. So that's it for Bumpy. <laughs> All right. So I actually I had went to school for psychology, um, intentionally to find out answers on what was going on with my experience, my community's experience, my family's experience, I wanted answers. And I wanted to be in a position to help the mental health aspect of um, our community. So that was my original career path. And I actually graduated and went into that field. I worked for uh, Prince George's County government right out of college. After that, I had always had my hands tied into higher education um, on the administrative side. So I then transitioned into higher education administration. So those were the two areas that I was working in prior to this. And what's great about that is that I'm still using those skills from those experiences in my now present job. And I again realized that it was all part of this divine plan because I'm that much more effective as a dance studio that focuses on healing in the arts. And then I also um, have a deep passion. I asked myself before I went into building the business, I said, do I wanna be an entrepreneur? Do I wanna, uh, as they call it, kind of be my own boss, so to say? And that wasn't me. I wanted to be an organizational leader. I wanted to have an impact on how people got hired and fired. And I, that's why I knew I had to go further my education, earn my master's in business administration and actually hold a position where I was able to um, effectively serve my community in terms of how people were hired, fired and felt valued at a company. And that was because of my last uh, job that laid me off. Um, and so that's really what led the 
career I had before and what kind of influenced and led me to that next step. Thank you all for your guys' responses. Um, my next question is directed towards Daryl. And yep. it is, what is the best and most challenging part of having a business? Employees. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, it's it's um, the best part is the freedom. It's the, um, it's the, the challenge of, of, the, of opt obstacles you have to overcome because each and every day you still have to fulfill and you have to, no matter what, how about this, no matter what, you have to complete your task because every day you have to open up the doors. Uh, if the inventory is late, if the drivers like, this year we had issues with uh, drivers. Uh, the driver caught COVID and I couldn't get my product. And uh, the, the trucks uh, were late. And so it's, it's overcoming obstacles, but you have to still work through it. So uh, that's kind of what I, uh, the obstacles that you have to hurdle and Employees also, because sometimes they don't want to come to work, and when they don't want to come to work, that means you got to work. And juggling employees. Uh, the good part about all, all of this is that it's yours. It's yours. It's yours. It's it's yours, and you see the impact, and you see uh, the the for in the community, you see the impact that it has on people that watched you grow up and they're like, wow, this is amazing. So you're excited at that. You're excited that you're able to help out the community and you're excited that you're able to help, you know, other people also. I hope that answered the question. It did. Thank you so much. Yeah. And now taking a question from the Q&A panel, um, which this will be open to everyone. What elements from your previous work were you able to translate well into your entrepreneurial venture? Were there skills that you were able to add to your figurative toolkit that really helped you get to your current line of work? Can I just I'll share? start. Uh, be nice to your customers. Be nice to your customers. That's what I can share. You can go, Lenny. <laughs> I was just going to say, uh, recently, due to the pandemic, I've applied for several grants um, that's been really helpful for my businesses. And I would say when I was in grad school, um, working on my thesis and had to write grants for community organizations, that certainly has helped me um, you know, 15, 16 years later. So uh, you never know down the road how that will work. I mean, I was sharing earlier with another panel how um, throughout my career, never have I been able to apply and receive grants. So um, it's been great in that regard. So um, not so much my career, but certainly education, higher education has helped. Okay, skills for my entrepreneurial venture. So I like to talk to people. And so I like to get to understand people and their needs. So when people walk through the door, I'm, I'm very good at reading them. Um, nice. uh, like astrology plays a big role in that too. Um, we can literally sit in here and read, are they an air sign? Um, do they want to talk? Do they feel chatty? And then if they want to chat, then you chat them up and then they want to buy more books or we're finding out because we have a lot of books in here, even in the small space. So um, getting them to open up, we're like, oh, is that something you're interested in? Bam, grab this book. And it's, oh, this is just what I was looking for and, and stuff like that. So and same thing with our mobile model, having the table and um, being able to, to find what they need just in a small table. Um, what other skills would I say? 
Oh man, the challenges from last year. Um, negotiating like um, conflict and confrontation, especially in business and especially as a woman. And um, oh boy, um, everything from sexual advances, you have to navigate around um, um, people working for you, people you're working with, blah, blah, blah. Like you have to, you have to have a, read the book, Art of Seduction. It'll help you get a job. It'll help you in sales. It'll help you with a lot of different things, but um, using those types of skills to deal with major conflicts uh, in these situations or, or stuff like that, that those are big ones. Um, and should I wait till the next round to answer the question that was directed towards me in the Q&A or should I just answer it? Um, you can answer it right now if you'd like to. Okay, yeah, I'd love to. So CompoTax, getting started with that. So my last year, of, it was 2019 when I did my, my taxes with my former tax preparer. And I had a lot of questions that um, they didn't necessarily have time to answer for me. And I'm very curious. And I had already heard of this tax franchise opportunity through being in those spaces, uh, like I said, where I was learning from my uh, black community. So there was a tax franchising opportunity as a, as a mobile office. And I'd seen they had a great model for over 30 years and they were upstanding and they answered all my questions. And I, I was like, look how much I pay in taxes. You can make six figures in three months, three, four months. And I was like, oh, that'll be perfect. Cause when there's a downtime for retail, it's tax season, of course. And so I was like, this will be a perfect marriage. Um, um, but then, yeah, I hit the lottery with one and then it was just all a lot. But now you know, coming back to it and I'm literally able to help my friends with amending their returns and things like that or getting them to understand how it works. And I'm understanding how, I have a happy client right here. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> But um, it, it, it's great and having products and being able to show them how taxes work and how you can improve your situation. That's why I decided to go with that. I guess I'll add to that. Um, I would say everything, everything you're learning right now as college students will contribute. Um, because it's in you. It's hardwired. You didn't work. You didn't study all those years for nothing. It will um, have its reward. But I would say for me, the key skills were one, public speaking. Um, I had to deal with the community. I was um, a front face. I had a front facing job. So I had to learn how to uh, deep listen to my clients. I had to learn how to um, just have an ear for their needs. And so I would also say, um, my um, writing, it matters because when you go to apply for grants or when you just have to draft your meetings or you have to share things with your employees, you, you know, being organized and being able to write and present will matter as a leader of a business organization. And lastly, I would just say um, presentation. Um, Presentation, I had a lot of experience um, with presentation on my former jobs. And so it just all kind of came together. So. All right, and now my next question is directed towards Sheena. Um, how do you use Black, um, sorry, how do you use bostonwildblack.org to foster and sustain a strong network in the Black community? How is it used? I'm sorry, is that the question? Yes. Um, so, you know, like I mentioned when I was speaking, a big part of what I, I use community um, in my own relationships to build the business. And now with Boston Wild Black, we have almost 300 members. Uh, we just launched in, in July. And it's it's a range of industries. I mean, people literally from former senators to state reps to doctors to grad students. Um, and so I personally um, utilize a lot of the services of my members. Um, I've um, 
you know, we really have, people don't have to go too far to kind of find the things that they need. And, and that's, that's essentially what we're trying to create is that you have your community, your tribe, um, kind of right at your fingertips and know how to access resources. So just in the last week I've been to, um, I've been able to work with a member who's a nutritionist because, you know, being home during COVID, lots of um, extra eating going on. Um, also one of our members who um, has a skincare line um, and, and ordering some of her products and sending it to friends of mine. We have a, a member who has a cake, cupcake company that I think literally everyone in the membership has ordered from because she delivers. Uh, but it really is, you know, we're creating this way for people to be able to support each other um, in whatever we're doing. And we're actually starting something soon called BWB Academy um, because a lot of what people were asking for was actually wealth building um, programming and, and are there ways that we can um, learn from each other how to build wealth, but also maybe even purchase things together in kind of cooperative economics. So we're, that's something that we're looking on later this year. Um, is as we continue to grow the community is really how do we um, purchase from each other, build each other, um, build with each other um, and find ways to um, utilize all of our different skills to enhance each other's lives. Thank you so much. And now our next question is directed to all of our panelists. Um, how did mentors in your life guide you or in other words, help you to believe in your ability to pursue to pursue your dreams and your goals. What have they shared that you apply in your daily life today? And we can start off with um, Lenny. I was kind of still thinking, <laughs> but um, I would say a mentor that I can think of, I think he might be on here, maybe his daughter is, but he was my Sunday school teacher, Dr. Anthony Hill. And he's someone that I certainly admired as a, a husband and a father and a, a good Christian leader. Someone that um, he may not be a business owner, but someone that um, had great values and, and ethics when it comes to life, life skills and quality of life. Um, and I think, when it comes to just other spaces or mentors, when it comes to business, probably someone like Damon John, um, reading his book was really inspirational and had the opportunity to uh, meet him in New York and attend one of his workshops on business. So that gave me more confidence and insight on um, the clothing space and uh, propelled me to go, go even further and um, uh, realize my dreams that it's it's possible even when you feel like you may not have the right tools or the right connections to to make it happen. Okay, mentors, um, man, the the actual inspiration. Uh, so Tony Browder, who wrote this book, the first book that I read, following him in a way, he has kind of mentored my way through this process like um yeah uh, i go from reading his book and, and following his lectures to um popping up at business conventions together and we're taking pictures together with um his book um, because i'm selling it in the same area so it's like he's been a part of the my mentor they are so important especially black business mm. mentors because we never see us we don't right. ever see us. So when they are there and they're so, they are, we're already like stretched thin, you know, being business owners. So for them to make any sort of time to give back, um, we just started the Black Business Alliance out here in Connecticut, right in 2018, um, um, when, when I started my business. And that's where those mentors showed up. They fed us, they mentored us. They showed us how to trust each other as young entrepreneurs. And these young entrepreneurs also have been like mentors of, of ourselves. Like we've been mentoring each other as well. They, we were given that model from these elders in, um, in business, you know, and um, 
and just showing us how to also pass money amongst our own hands, you know, and I've, I've built my business from black owned businesses, from my logo being created by a black owned business, this actually being printed by a black owned business, website, keybookstore.com, black owned, and then our franchise is black owned from the top, um, you know, all the way down. So practicing that and listening and reading of our mentors, um, you know, like you said, Damon John, I also uh, follow him as far as business goes. And um, they're, they're so important. Find your, what do they call them? Um, chambers of commerce. There's especially black ones in places like Boston, Texas has them um, and things like that. Um, and we have the BBA out here, but yeah, they, they are everything. Uh, for, for me, uh, the, um, I read the book, Nathan McCall makes me want to holler. And, uh, that book kind of changed my whole entire life. My, I, I would have to say that my, that my parents were my, uh, real um, motivators and people that, that were really influential in my life. So um, again, um, hard for, for me, it was hard work and um, having really, really good uh, people that you can depend on. I'll, I'll put it like, like that and and your friends so if i answered it thank you i would say i would say my mentors have been extremely instrumental on how to how to how to treat people i I'm also inspired by my family. I'm a third generation business owner. Um, so my great aunts and uncles have businesses and it's been in the family. Um, my mother's a broker, uh, only black female broker in the city of Springfield for over 15 years. Um, I just sit at their feet. I ask them questions. How do I address certain situations that may be problematic? How to problem solve? Um, how to take care of people, but still hold on to your values. Uh, mentors have also just been there for wisdom. The, I call them the access points for wisdom. You need someone older than you, wiser than you, someone who's just lived longer than you that you can ask, how do I address this situation? Um, or, you know, am I seeing this in the full capacity that I should? Because you don't want to limit yourself. So a lot of times we're hurt by what we don't know. So mentors have been extremely instrumental on paving the way through representation, paving the way just through their efforts and their hard work. And most importantly, it keeps you humble. Um, business is not for the proud. It's about serving others and those who have the heart to serve from um, to lead from a servant position, um, I believe that really um, it shows up in the relationships and the connections and the, um, I would say the members that you have or the people who patronize your business. So mentors have just been examples for me, wisdom wise, representation wise, leadership wise. Thank you all so much. Um, and now my next question is, do any of you guys have any advice or warnings regarding starting, registering, and maintaining your business? So in the sense of incorporations, marketing, and taxes. Can I share something? Yes. Yeah, one thing I would say is to make sure if um, once you come up with a name is to consult with an intellectual property attorney because um, I've learned of some businesses, unfortunately, that had to, that were issued a cease and desist letter because of a name being existing in another state or even locally. Um, and that's not something that you want to spend your marketing dollars on with paraphernalia, flyers, uh, marketing online um, because of, you know, not doing your due diligence. So that's something I would certainly share to avoid. I'm sure others have some other things to say. 
and look for resources in your community. So um, like we have University of Hartford's Entrepreneurial Center and things like that here in Connecticut. Uh, that helped me to write my business plan. Um, also UConn uh, gave legal help with like copywriting and, and trademarking and things like that. And that's been a great help to even understanding um, that process. I like to understand processes before I pay people. And if you're not able to clearly understand uh, or describe your process, then well, we don't we don't have to do business together. But um, yeah, and do like Lenny said, do your research. It's simple to do a, a Google. But somebody say something. Okay. Um, yeah, Google. Um, and see what comes up when you put in your business name at the very least and getting registered with the state, making sure that you have your sales and use uh, tax permit and that you know how to pay your sales tax and how to calculate it, whether it's with a calculator or whether it's integrated into your point of sale system as well. I would say, believe in yourself from the, the beginning, write out your vision, write your, out your ideas, bring it to some of your closest friends um, that you trust um, your vision with. Um, but I will also say when you start embarking and moving upon your process, don't go into it thinking small minded. Um, I, I, would, I went into it already tracking data from day one and I only had five people in my class or I only had three people that would show up. I mean, but I was like, I need to know my numbers. I need to know. I mean, it was handwritten at that time. Now everything we've digitized, but I'm, I wanted to know, go in with the, uh, the mindset of, hey, this is not a four, uh, five, Fortune 500 company or this is not a multi-million dollar company yet but go in with that mindset, track, do your data, um, cross your T's and dot your I's, don't uh, think small, think big, and trust yourself and believe in yourself. For me, Daryl, I would have to say, uh, because this business has so many different components, uh, you have to, for me, I, I have to hire a really good herbalist I have to have a, have a really good accountant. I have to have a really good bookkeeper. Uh, I have to have a person that manages my inventory. Uh, so you, you um, again, you're, you, you have to kind of have a really good team, if I can explain it like that. A, a powerful team is what helps us you know, remain successful. Um, quickly, Daryl, like you mentioned, uh, I want to bring up the accounting part because I was recent, I'm still involved in an, a difficult situation where um, these accountants will get a hold of your, your books and they will hold on to them and, and keep you from being able to go to a bank with updated statements, um, investors and things like that. Um, be careful for what you're signing up for. Make sure that by the time you need an accountant, that there's somebody you're able to call, you know their name, you can get directly in touch with them. Don't just go with some big company conglomerate that does accounting for thousands of businesses. Don't do that. Mm. <laughs> can I also share that locally, and I'm sure in other states um, or statewide, there are um, accelerator programs and business incubator programs. So locally, there's the you know Small Business Administration. There's the office right across from SCCC, Springfield Technical Community College, and um, there's Valley Venture Mentors. There's Entrepreneurship for All, which is based in Holyoke, but there's other offices throughout the state of Mass. So they are all there. They're all free programs and great resources for um, you if you're looking to pursue a program. That's what I went through. Um, well, I went through a couple of them when I was pursuing my, my sock line. It gave me a lot of confidence, but also held me accountable. Uh, 
Um, before we move on to our next question, I just wanted to quickly ask Sheena if she had any input on that as well. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it was said, but the the piece around the, on the financial, um, what I was going to add, something that was a, a saving grace for me, particularly when COVID hit, um, was already having some things in place. And I think, um, you know, I had an accountant and a bookkeeper, and I, I think that can be in a, in a lawyer as well. And I think those are services that sometimes we might feel like we, we can or shouldn't pay for until we're of a certain size. Um, but I really put those into my budget from the beginning. I am not a financially savvy person, um, particularly on the business side. I'm, I'm learning it as I, as I grow and I need to know um, how my own finances, but I invested early in having those professionals. And then what happened when when COVID hit, I was able to apply really quickly for things like Paycheck Protection Program and um, the SBA loans um, because I had those people already and my finances were already together and I already had a banking relationship. And so I think as early as people can do that and, and not feel intimidated, um, you know, you can find, you, you don't need the full services that a corporation needs. So um, you can find, um, folks that work with small businesses and can work within your budget. Um, and to, to what was said earlier <clears throat> from Kimani, something I would add as well is um, having a separate accountant and bookkeeper so that you have a little checks and balances uh, so that, um, you know, if you have the same person keeping your books that does your taxes and you don't under have your own understanding of that stuff, you don't know, you know, they could be um, not doing what they're supposed to be doing, but when you have two different companies or people or entities doing it, you know, some they're kind of checking each other's work. Uh, so I would definitely suggest that as well. Um, but overall, just not feeling like it's too early to think about finances. It's, it's definitely from day one, something um, you should figure out how to invest in. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is directed towards Kaimani and the audience member was asking, can you please talk a little bit more about how astrology converes with the way you conduct business? Um, is anybody even on the, the panelist group uh, a fan of astrology or, or believe in it or think think anything of it? You wanna like raise a hand? Or... I, I'm getting into it. My friends are into human design and astrology and so I, I'm, I'm learning about it. What's your sign, Sheena? A cancer. A cancer. Okay. Uh, was somebody, Daryl, were you going to say something? Yeah, I'm also cancer. I'm cancer. <laughs> One thing we found in here is we cannot work with cancer. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we can't do it. But uh, we, we, uh, it, I'm telling you right now, I don't, I've studied it for years and actually we were able to uh, bring one of our uh, workshop hosts um, uh, onto a live on Instagram, somebody that I've watched for years on YouTube and um, talk about astrology to our entire audience. But really, if you study it, there's so many things you can, you can learn about how you simply connect with other people. It, it's, it's like a way to relate. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. It's, um, it's not just about like, oh, are we compatible or not, blah, blah, blah. But uh, it's how are we compatible? How can we work together? And what are maybe the limitations of our potential relationship together um, business-wise or, or, or whatnot? And just the more you understand the potential someone has to interact with you, the more you're going to be able to combat what they're what they're doing or how you're interacting uh, exactly. so I'm sure that person that probably asked that question already studies it and can see where that influences um, business thank you so much and now our next question is for all of our panelists here do you promote the importance of education within your community? And if so, what messages of encouragement do you use? I 
I, I'll start. Uh, I always promote education as a tool to better your life, increase your um, income or overall understanding um, and knowledge. And it's, it's more than just academic, it really is a life um, investment. And I would say that your education, um, I would say this, I always think to myself, how far can I take someone else if I haven't gone that far? So with education, you can take someone that much further because you went that much further, right? And so as a leader, how far can you take others? Well, as far as you've gone and when you go, uh, the further you go in education and your knowledge and understanding, you can take others along. Can I share? I would like to say um, recently I've been blessed with the opportunity to share my experience with some budding photographers. So many times they'll sh shadow me at an event. Um, so I'm sharing some tips on the industry, be it technical side or just business side of photography, as well as others that are interested in starting a, a clothing line, um, meeting with someone on Friday um, that has an idea and meeting him for the first time, but he was referred to me and I'm looking forward to sewing into him and sharing some insight and, and encouraging him. Um, and then also I'm partnering with other organizations. Recently I collaborated with a local gym and we, we gave a workshop for young males teaching them about male etiquette, um, teaching them about tie and tie, how to dress properly for interview, um, interview questions, how to answer them properly. So in a way that's giving back to community or in educating the community, um, maybe not in a so formal sense, but it's definitely um, required and necessary tools for, for success. Uh, I mean, clearly we focus on education here, but our mission is divine liberation, one page at a time. And in business, I found just like with engineering, just like with anything else, literacy in any component is extremely important. You could be brilliant, but if you don't understand how law is written and interpreted, if you don't understand how taxes, how they're written and interpreted, it, it might not make logical sense how the law is written, but that's how it's written. So you have to be literate in all these different spaces um, in, in order to be successful. So we, yeah, here we encourage literacy in finances and in your own history. So people can't just tell you about yourself. You can tell, you can tell them. Yes, if, if I can also uh, tag in, uh, in this area here, when you're talking about health in terms of food and, uh, the, the proper food that we're supposed to be eating, um, a number of my employees are, they either want to become uh, nutritionists, they wanna become herbalists, um, and uh, they're in school now. Uh, but what happens at the store here is, is that they have to learn about vitamins and nutrition and and you're supposed to eat a certain amount of greens every day and it, it's uh, a food health so for me uh in the grocery business uh it's a it's a it's a starting point for a lot of the uh younger college kids that i have working here And I think our last question for the evening will be, um, sorry, just pulling it up here. Okay. Um, what tips do you have to offer for someone that is considering rejoining the small business market? Oh. Uh, Oh. <laughs> I would say um, refuse to have a bad day, okay? 
that's my tip. I think it kind of depends on the industry, but I, what would be helpful is maybe doing you know, a focus group on what you're looking to do so you can figure out a strategy for attacking the business uh, might be helpful. Um, certainly utilize those resources that we shared earlier locally um, or, you know, there are even nationally because they can give you um, some good grounding so that you can feel more confident moving forward and you're not just um, going about it without an overall game plan because some may say, um, you know, create a business plan. Some may not say that. Um, depends on if you're bootstrapping your business or you're looking for loans or um, maybe a venture cap capitalist. So I think it really depends on what the business is and how you would like to um, approach it. Yeah, I was just saying, if you're going to be re-entering in the now, know your, know your competitors, know the market. Like there's not, you know, I, there's not a black bookstore, you know, you really can tell me that I haven't heard of. Like, and, and not just black bookstores are not my competition. Like competition, how do I stand out from H&R Block? How do I stand out from TurboTax um, and, and understanding? And now I'm even understanding the benefits of a tax specialist versus you being able to put whatever you want into the software, literally so the IRS can flag you and hunt you down. So yeah, know your competitors, make sure any room you walk into, you, you know, who they're talking about already and how you stand out from them. Read a book called The Purple Cow. I would say do your um, industry analysis. I would also say do your forecasting just based on that research information you find. And then I would also add to think ahead and start thinking of ways to grow your business. So growth business strategies, um, just to see how successful you have the potential to be or see or gauge how much work this may take. Um, yeah, before you jump back in. Can I just add to what I said? I think what Kimani said is poignant especially if you're re-entering the workforce or the business world, because when I first started photography in 04, um, there weren't probably half as many as photographers that there are now. So over the four, 17 years, it's changed tremendously. I think the access to digital um, technology has evolved and the quality and um, it's much more competitive. So what would set you apart from the rest? Um, not knowing what your industry is, but certainly uh, keep that in mind, it's important. All right, well, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our student leaders. Good evening, folks. My name is Ramona East. I work in student life here at Bay Path University as the assistant director for student engagement. And I am a proud member of this year's Black History Month planning committee. And I have the honor of, of closing us out this evening. And for that, I'm going to need your help. So if you have enjoyed this event, if you are a supporter of our students, a supporter of our panelists and our businesses that we have featured here, please type yes, yes in the chat. Uh, type it so that all of the attendees and our panelists can see it. This is wonderful work that we do here at Bay Path and it's wonderful work that our panelists do. So please, yes, this is beautiful. Yes, yes, it's been a, a beautiful, beautiful evening. Uh, so nice. thank you again to, to all of our panelists and to our students. Um, I want to recognize our student leader, Cora Swan, for the beautiful flyers and imagery that she has been able to create. Her and Janelle did such a wonderful job this evening uh, moderating this event. We have, uh, this is our third event as part of our Black History Month series. And uh, we have another event this Friday, our Black Student Union here at Bay Path will be hosting a virtual poetry jam in collaboration with student leaders 
from the local school area. So we will have AIC, Springfield College, Western New England as part of our lineup of poets on Friday. So if you are interested, please be on the lookout for communication about that. We will also be, uh, be on the lookout for communication surrounding our On The Move event. Uh, and that will be March 8th. And so another wonderful, wonderful networking opportunity and event to connect with, with folks around some interesting, interesting topics this year. So please, please, please be on the lookout for, for all of that wonderful stuff. And um, before I bring our panelists up, just to plug their social media and to uh, share with you all how they can stay in connection with you, I just want to thank uh, the extended Black History Month Planning Committee. It, it takes truly a village to put on these sorts of events. And it's through this collaboration that we're able to host such wonderful, wonderful programs. Uh, so uh, a quick shout out to our tech assistant, M Melissa Wirtz. She has been phenomenal at every single event um, and has been able to allow us to host these events so flawlessly. Justin Latelier also is uh, a wonderful, wonderful colleague and has helped us with these events and hosting and to our extended Black History Month committee, thank you. This has been a, a wonderful, wonderful series and I can't wait till next year. I can't wait till the rest of the semester to continue to um, uplift these wonderful themes that we've been talking about today. So we uh, had some hands raised in the, the chat and I assume those folks wanna continue to connect with you all as are our panelists. So I'm going to bring up Lenny first to, to talk about how folks can stay in connection with you, Lenny. Could you share with us how folks can follow you on social media all that great stuff. Yeah, thank you again, Bay Path. It's great being with you all um, again. Uh, I was with you in 2019, I believe, with some business students. Shout out to Crystal Center Brown. I think she was my contact <laughs> for that. Um, but it's good to be here with you for Black History Month and um, pray that our paths continue to cross. So you can find me at www.upscalesocks.com, underwoodphoto.net, and you can also find Upscale Socks on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Wonderful. Thanks, Lenny. I'll, I'll start with Comportax Flame. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, at Comportax Flame. And you can also book your appointments right through there and ask us any questions. And then Key Bookstore, you can find us on Twitter, um, Instagram, and Facebook at Key Bookstore, and then definitely our state-of-the-art website, keybookstore.com. We're dropping our new website in a week or two. Thanks, Lenny. Okay, this is for Bumpy's Natural and Organic Foods. We're at 908 Allen Street in Springfield, Massachusetts. We'd love to see you all come, come down. Um, info at Bumpy's Bargain. Dot com. That's info at bumpiesbargain.com. Um, it's a wonderful store. We wanted to kind of emulate uh, the Whole Foods, that whole look. But you come down, you'll have a wonderful experience. Thanks, Daryl. I'm at uh, Rooted Essence, dance.com. And we are actually just launched. We just launched our business doors. We're open. We are offering online classes for adults of all sizes, skill levels, and ages. Um, and we actually just finished our Intro to West African Dance series for the Black History Month. And Friday night, we have a diaspora dance festival where you can uh, come and take classes. And we actually raffled off tickets to some of you um, but rootedessencedance.com and then Rooted Essence on social media via Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Well, there you have it. Please go follow them. Please go support these wonderful entrepreneurs. Thank you all. And I want to share. I want to share. Make sure. Oh, go ahead, Sheena. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, so um, bostonwildblack.com um, is the site, but really you know, any, if you're in any part of the state, I would encourage you to connect with us. This, this virtual world has, has opened us up. So, um, and then on IG at Boston Wild Black and Twitter at Boss Wild Black. Um, and we will be having some, we're a membership 
organization, but we'll be having some public events coming up, um, particularly a series called Black Boston Reimagined that we host every quarter talking about how to reimagine this region as um, a thriving place for Black people. So um, please get on the list so that you can learn more about that. Wonderful. Well, there you have it. Thank you all so much uh, for attending this event and, and have a wonderful evening. Good night. Thank you all. Thank you guys. Thank you, Bay Path. Thank you so much.